John riding with us from RDQ Economics, one of the few people that can say he's hung out the shingle at the Bank of England and uh, with our Federal Reserve System. Just to completely digress here, sitting in this chair six weeks ago was Howard Davies of the London School of Economics with William Bowder sitting here. I said on radio it was about honor. Uh, he just immediately solved the problem at the London School of Economics, this with Libya allegations. Who is Sir Howard Davies and what does this mean for economics in the United Kingdom? Oh, I don't think it means a great deal for uh, economics in the UK. I mean, London School's a, a great school and I don't think it's in any way uh, significantly, uh, turned out to be significantly compromised. I thought everyone was doing deals with uh, Libya. Look at the uh, former Prime Minister mm -hmm. of England and the release of the Lockerbie bomber, who's still alive, and that appeared to have oil related connections. So uh, I think I'll get through but this. You, both you and I know Sir Howard, and the idea here is he solved his problem quickly. He just resigned yeah. to get it out of the way and move on. Sure, like the equivalent of you know, going into a room and taking a revolver out the drawer and you know, yeah. taking, taking care of it. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that was a good thing. Well, hopefully not just reputation. Let's get back to business here. And we see, this is a chart we mentioned earlier. John, let me explain this chart to you. Semi-log, March is logarithm month, month, folks. Sarah, you can make a banner of that. March is logarithm month here at Surveillance Midday. Semi-log, not in the labor force. I took the good years from 2000 to the summer of 2008. There's the regression, and we're now out two to three standard deviations. There's so many millions out of the game. Did they just assume they get back in the game with an improving labor economy? Well, we had assumed that, and they didn't show up in February, and so the unemployment rate fell again. But if you dig within the numbers, and we've started to do that in terms of the demographics, it was particular groups that uh, dropped out of the labor force in February and therefore held that uh, uh, labor force participation oh. flat. Uh, teenagers, uh, age 16 to 19, uh, and uh, Hispanics, big drop in Hispanic participation. You look at it, it looks like it's just a uh, freak reading and that it's going to bounce back. But bigger picture, um, I do think that the, it, it's a very significant right. question as to whether we're in, I hate the term new normal, but whether we are in right. a new normal on labor force participation, in which case the unemployment would fall more quickly than we think. Right. But uh, it, I don't think it means a lot for the economy. Let's bring in Mark Zandi, Moody Analytics here, John Riding and Mark Zandi uh, with us. Mark, you wrote a paper, Blinder Zandi, it was really not iconic, but immediately codified as Blinder Zandi, the government help. Did the government get us to 8.9% unemployment rate? I think it helped, uh, Tom. I think if uh, we hadn't gotten the policy response that we got in its totality, then uh, the economy would be in a measurably worse place. Uh, we'd have fewer jobs today, higher unemployment, and I, I'd, I'd also say the cost to taxpayers would have been greater. So I think the policy response in its totality was a good response. Mark, we've got a, a chart up here, the unskilled Employed, this is employed less than high school degree, which is a category. John Riding mentioning teens and Hispanics missing in action. This is a sad chart. Based on your research, how do we employ the unskilled, those that can't compete for those knowledge economy jobs? Well, there's only really one good way, and we need to raise their skill level and their educational attainment. So. You know, when we think about uh, the budget cutting that we need to engage in, I mean, I think we need uh, government spending restraint going forward. We need to prioritize how we do that cutting. And the one thing we want to try to preserve as best we can is spending on education, uh, job retraining, those kinds of things to try to bring those folks back into the labor force. Within the jobs report today and with our fiscal challenges, do we have a chance of doing that? Or are we so out of whack now, John, writing on the fiscal deficit that we're not going to be able to do what Mark's talking about? Well, I think we do have to have the cuts, and I don't think the employment consequences will be as great as some people think. But in terms of education spending, what we really need to do is to get some efficiencies in. Uh, Wisconsin is an extremely uh, important uh, uh, battleground because it's about the ability to, uh, for example, to lay off teachers who are 
not based on seniority, but based on performance, so that we can uh, get the best out of our education dollar money. It's clear in New York, I'm afraid we don't. What would you get like to see out come out of, out of Wisconsin? Uh, I, well, first of all, I'd like to see a much more balanced share of. Um, pension payments and uh, health care spending split between uh, the employees and the government. But first I'd like to see the, the missing senators, missing in action, actually come back and do their job. Really? That would be shocking. Uh, yes. Does that ever happen in the United Kingdom? I mean, Mark, think about this. I mean, they're still over there at the Coke machine in Illinois sneaking Coca-Colas at some uh, Laurent Motel. Mark Zandi, what would you like to see come out of this debate in Wisconsin? You know, Tom, I'm not going to enter into that debate. Uh, that's uh, above my pay grade, so I'll let that for John and for you to debate. I'm, I'm just not going to enter in. Well, that's fair. Okay, I, I'll, I'll go with that. Mark Sandy, what did you learn about today's jobs report? It was a good report. You know, obviously it was juiced up a bit by a bounce back from the really bad weather in January. But, uh, you know, even abstracting from that, uh, I think underlying job growth is around 150 k per month, which is, you know, good. Uh, it's not good enough. We need something that's north of that to really start bringing down unemployment in a substantive way. But I think we're going to get that. I think all the uh, stars are aligned. Mm -hmm. uh, businesses are in really good shape, and we're going to get much better job growth going forward. Bring up this chart quickly, a structural challenge. Mark Zandi uh, is the... Un are the unemployed delaying searching for jobs because of extended benefits? I think that the extension of UI benefits has played a role in the higher unemployment rate. The best research indicates that it's about a half a point, maybe as high as a percentage point. But on net, I think the emergency UI benefits was a very significant positive for the economy. Oh. It's not a slam dunk positive. There are disincentives. Right. We can see it in the data, but there, on net, it was a positive. Uh, this was interesting this morning on Bloomberg Surveillance. I spoke with Dennis Gartman of the Gartman Letter, and I asked him if he is willing to give any credit to the president and his administration for the good news in the jobs report. I will give full faith and credit to American businessmen and American businesswomen and to a growing economic environment around the rest of the world. But will I give any credit to the president? None whatsoever. Oh, no surprise. I did that for Mark Sandy just to get him going. I mean, Sandy, I, you and I'm sure Dennis uh, disagree on this matter. What would you like to see going forward, Mark? What do we need in terms of policy to keep the good news of today going? Well, I think uh, we have gotten all the stimulus that we need. Uh, the Federal Reserve is engaged in QE through mid-year. I think it ends at that point. We'll get some tightening in 2012. I think we're done with any additional fiscal stimulus. I think now it's a matter of uh, restraint. It's just a matter of uh, the timing of when that restraint should kick in. Uh, but I think we're pretty close. Uh, but I do think that uh, the government's role in our economy should now wind down. Uh, I, it, in fact, it already has. The stimulus is already fading quite quickly. Uh, but I think that would be prudent over time to, to pull back. Right. And, and now we've got to focus on our deficit and debt. Uh, Victor, come on over here, if you would. I know you're way over on the other side of the set. This is the GFK United Kingdom Confidence Indicator, John Writing. Off we go. We come back. And this is like a little bit of an austerity rollover. From where you sit, John Riding, your experience in the United Kingdom, is austerity working? Well, they're taking far deeper austerity in the UK than is going to come out of the uh, uh, compromise budget, or even if the Republicans got their whole hundred billion. Uh, right. the, the UK austerity is deeper, quicker. But I, I don't like this austerity debate because we should be about sustainability. And the problem is you can cut spending now, but we have unsustainable trends in Medicare spending, in Social Security spending. We didn't get serious health care reform. We did nothing that would change incentives and tackle the rapidly growing costs. We need to go back to the drawing board on these issues and come up with a sustainable fiscal plan. Then we don't have to worry about cutting right. everything now. I want to ask both of you this. This is important. Are we all going to work forever? Uh, I'm afraid I'm planning <laughs> to. Yeah, Mark Sandy, are we all going to work forever? No. I mean, I think that we have gotten overly pessimistic. I mean, we've got our challenges, very serious, significant ones, but we have always risen to those challenges, and I see no reason to expect that we won't this go around as well. And, you know, Ameri at, at core, 
the American business American businesses are in very good shape. They are very profitable. Their balance sheets are very healthy. Credit starting to flow. Uh, I think we are very we are poised for some very good solid growth going forward. Good, John, we have some I, I, policy yeah. issues. We need to address them. But if we do, we're going to be in good shape. John, I, jump I, I, would, in here. I would just say, American large businesses are in good shape, but small businesses are shackled with taxes that are too high, too much regulation. And it's the small businesses that will be creating the jobs right. of the future, not the Fortune 500. This chart blew me away, folks. I did not. I learned something every day using the Bloomberg terminal. Oldsters participating more. I'm sorry, Mark Zandi and John Riding, you wouldn't understand this, but 55 to 64. That's labor participation among 55 to 64. Up, up it goes over a solid uh, 10, 20 years, maybe 30 years there. Can't remember. And then the white line is. Is the labor participation that's been rolling over recently. What does it signal to you, John Riding, that you see the 55 group working and working and working? Is it just demographics? Well, I think it's two things. I, I think it's knowledge economy uh, and uh, accumulating knowledge uh, keeps people can retrain and move to different areas more easily than in the past if they've had a lifelong job. And secondly, I think it's the fact that people are looking for it. You asked me, are we going to work forever? People are looking at the prospects of retirement, are looking at what's happened to retirement funds, and um, uh, they're uh, working more. Mm -hmm. Mark Sandy. Can uh, I make a point, Tom? Tom, Tom yes. just a one quick uh, technical point. Uh, one reason why that uh, participation rate for that group is rising is because the baby boomers are in the very early parts of that uh, demographic. You know, they're in their mid-50s. So you have a very large proportion of that group in the early part of that group when participation rates are higher. So if you count for that technical issue, it hasn't risen as much. John is right. I agree with his fundamental points, but it, it's not. It's overstated by looking at that data. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I agree with that fully. Let's bring up this research folk uh, note, folks. Note of the day, Peter Hooper, Deutsche Bank, uh, the U.S. labor market here. Bring it up, tightening ahead. Read that headline again. U.S. labor market tightening ahead. We expect that some exits will prove to be permanent, reflecting secular trends, including a deceleration of the working age population. Mark Zandi, is there going to be a tight labor market? Uh, uh, we're a long way from that, Tom. I think we're a good solid four, five, six years. But I, I think the, the gist is right, that if we look down the road five to ten years from now, I don't think our problem is going to be uh, too many people unemployed. It is going to be that we're not going to be able to find the skilled mm -hmm. workers that we need to, to match the kinds of jobs that employers are creating. And to some degree, you can see it now in certain occupations and certain industries, but we've got a long way before we get from here right. to there. Okay, let's leave it there. Mark Sandy, Moody's Analytics, John Riding of RDQ Economics. Major shout out to John Riding giving us Bloomberg surveillance cricket analysis as Ireland took out his England. I'm surprised he didn't show up with bleach blonde hair and a pink mohawk, which is what the hero of the Irish cricket team was wearing as they took out the English at Bangalore. Sound like Roger Kipling or something like that. Pim Fox next. It's surveillance midday. Was I right, Bangalore? Bangalore? Bangalore. That's Bangalore. Right. That was the Bangalore. Thank you, everyone.